Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Fantasy Bros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. You can find me on Twitter at DanHarris80. It is Friday. We are running back Dan and Kyle in the morning, so Yates will be here in just a little bit. But like last year, we are doing it again every Friday. We are proud to welcome Dr. David Chow. Find him on uh, at ProFootballDoc.com. Find him on Twitter at ProFootballDoc. Doc, I'm so glad you're back here for another year. Are you ready to talk some injuries? I'm ready, and, and let me confess something. This is actually my favorite podcast to do. I prefer uh, doing this one to my own because to my uh, own, I'm just talking to myself and giving a rundown. I enjoy the conversations with you, so thank you. I really do look forward to this, actually, and not just because I enjoy talking to you, but because I want to learn something as a fantasy analyst, as a fantasy manager. And the biggest questions this week start with Saquon Barkley, of course. We talked about him a few weeks ago when you were on. You had great analysis there. Everything apparently looks good for him to play this weekend against the Broncos. Joe Judge said this morning that everything is, quote, promising. So let's assume right now that he doesn't have any setbacks before the game and he does play. How effective do you think he can be in this game? Well, I think there's a couple questions about Saquon. Of course, the final hurdle to play, which looks like is happening. And there's a question of how effective. But the big question also, the usage, right? And, uh, you know, are they going to burn him into the ground the first time? I've been saying all along, right, recovery is never like a light switch. It's more like a slow sunrise, right? And so it's not like he got cleared. He was, wasn't was ready to go yesterday, and today now he's 100%. It's, it's a slow sunrise. And look, even if he plays, I just don't see how Saquon has 20-plus touches, right? And I've seen some fantasy estimates of 15. I think that's aggressive. Now, could it be... They go in planning on 8 to 10, and then the coaches do the old, oh, shoot, it's the flow of the game, and we didn't mean to? Of course, right? So no one can be sure. But I don't see how they go in planning on 15 touches for him. Um, You know, and you got to work him in slowly, et cetera. And you can't afford to suffer a setback. So we'll see what happens. But this is why on our new uh, six score, SIC score, He's not going to be anywhere near 100%. He's going to be, we'll put that out later today, uh, And uh, but he's going to be a middling, uh, about 50. I mean, so it's not normal Saquon Barkley. But he is looking like he will suit up, which is great news. And no question, we've always said his second half of the season is going to be much better than his first. Another running back dealing with some injury concerns. Is Austin Eckler a guy I was very excited about coming into the year? Now, he missed Wednesday and Thursday's practice with a hamstring injury. As we record this, we have not seen the practice report yet for Friday. But he obviously, he missed six games last year, Doc. And if memory serves, I try to always, you know, burn into my brain everything that you've said to me. You were on this last year where he kept teasing his return and you just kept saying, I don't see it. I don't see it. I think he's going to be out for a while. And he did wind up missing six weeks. Now, I know what you do better than anyone is you're able to diagnose injuries and the severity at a pretty good clip when you see a video. No video here. So I'm, you know, team sounds optimistic he's going to play. I am nervous because of the hamstring injury last year. Just any insight you can give on this right now. Look, you're right. And uh, I'll I'll, I'll give Bill Simmons uh, credit here. He at one point a couple years, I've never met the man. But my notifications lit up when, when he mentioned me on the podcast with Cousin cousin Sal. And yeah, yeah. this is going to date myself. I know what this is. I saw this first run. He said, that guy, Chow, I started following him. He's interesting. He's like a medical Quincy. Remember that yeah, show yeah. with Jack sure, Clark, sure. Quincy Medical Examiner? Like, I'm dating myself as well. But yes, yes, I do. My response to that was, I hope people don't think I look like Jack Klugman, but you're know, that old. But the bottom line is, yes, there is some medical detective work here. In this case, there is no video, and hamstrings are hard to tell on video anyways. And with the first practice report on Wednesday, not the first practice, they've obviously been practicing, but the first official injury report, he was on it. And to me, that was very significant. I get it. The Chargers don't want to play some of their stars in the preseason. Of course, I don't have a beat on head coach Brandon Staley the new head coach and how he wants to do things. No question. I could pick up the phone and call a number of people in the building, the athletic trainers, but I would never do that to them, right? That's insider information. 
I work on insider knowledge and how it works. So when that happened on Wednesday, it raised my eyebrows. And at ProFootballDoc.com, I put up a post saying, this does not bode well for Sunday because he didn't get hurt on Wednesday, yet he was out completely. It doesn't seal his fate, but I'm expecting him to actually not play on Sunday. It just doesn't bode well, and at least not a full go. And I, there are a lot of people on Twitter said, you're crazy, this is BS, and it's one practice. People rest all the time. I said, just this pattern I don't like. And sure enough, two days in a row DNP. So if we play it out now, what are the chances two straight DNP becomes an FP in full go? Not great. What are, Could two DNPs become an LP in some limited action? Maybe. But if you're a football team and he's your guy, and a hamstring can clearly aggravate and get worse, do you really wait another week to get him healthy week two, or do you play him and take the chance of losing him until October if he re-aggravates it? That's why I'm still, you got to watch all the injury reports and practice reports. At best, he will be listed as questionable. And I have him as kind of on the dubious side right now. But we'll see what happens. And yes, Austin Eckler once again teased that he's going to play week one. And right, right. the team was optimistic that he was going to play. Look, teams are optimistic that they're going to win by three touchdowns every week too. But does that happen? I mean, right? I mean, you know you know the, the old coaches thing. Every play in the NFL, including every running play, is designed to score a touchdown, right? Mm -hmm. Because if everybody blocks everybody and does the right thing, every play is a touchdown. That's the optimistic side. But does it happen? Obviously not. So we'll see. I hope he plays. I'm not wishing ill will on him. Using the Quincy skills, I you know didn't see it from Wednesday. I didn't see it. Yeah. All right, let's talk about somebody who I think hopefully has a little bit more optimism around him, and that is Cortland Sutton. He's returning, obviously, from the torn ACL. I mean, we all got a little worried, Doc, because we had some weird practice reports. He didn't look confident. He didn't play in the preseason games until the last one where he did. And from my very untrained eye, looked confident with his cutting and looked strong. So do we think there's going to be any limitations with him whatsoever here in week one? Uh, well, are there going to be any limitations? No, from the perspective that I think he's going to play the whole game and he's going to do Cortland Sutton things. But I don't know that he's 100% yet. But here's the advantages of why you see him. Look, he's looked better and better throughout the summer as I looked at his videos. The last one I saw maybe was two weeks ago. I don't know that he was 100%. But let me tell you, 95% Cortland Sutton, Sutton is pretty good. But here's the advantage. If he were a DB, I would be panning him. He is a wide receiver. A DB has to react. A wide receiver can dictate. And being able to dictate, I would assume the Broncos in Cortland have the right routes for him that he knows he can run well if they're smart about it, right? And at the line of scrimmage, he knows what he's about to do. Whereas the quarterback covering him, if he were coming off an ACL, would have to react. And that's what's harder. So I think Cortland Sutton can be productive. I think Cortland Sutton can have a quality game. But I don't think he's 100% yet. Interesting. Okay. All right. How about Trey Lancer, Doc? Very weird. He had the chip. I think it was a chip fracture, if that's what they called it. And they said seven days, but that I, I follow you on Twitter, as everybody should. You had a great little thread about it. And it did. he did return, I think, in seven days. But that just meant actually at practice and he could grip the ball. He hadn't even thrown yet. It sounds like they think he's going to be active for this game here against the Lions. But, I mean, can he be effective this quickly after that injury? Well... This was the first one that was a little bit interesting. I've had a pretty good beat on San Francisco. I love John Lynch. He's a San Diegan. Uh, uh, Kyle Shanahan. They've been very honest about their injuries. So honest to the point that if you go back to our podcast at Pro Football Doc in the offseason, right after Jared Goff got traded, we posted something with Lonnie Paxton, a friend of Jimmy G, a podcast that, that talked about hiding behind health, how the Rams hid behind health where it was predictable that Goff fell out of favor. And I said the same thing with Jimmy G, the way they handled their high ankle sprain. And sure enough, they traded and Trey Lance, and here you go. But here's the thing. It did not make sense to me when Kyle Shanahan said chip and then microchip and then seven days and that he would be healed. I think he just misspoke. 
There's no way a bone heals. I went back and looked at the video and could see the play where he hurt the hand. It seemed to be the index finger. It was late in the second half. So, sorry, late in the first half. And his next couple throws that he was driving it were not that accurate or no tight spirals. He played early in the second half, the third quarter, one series, and then was out. It clearly was already affecting him. It's more of a jammed finger with a capsular avulsion, so almost a pseudo dislocation injury. Obviously, your index finger is pretty important as a quarterback. Could he play this week, Sunday? Yes. Will he be the Trey Lance? And, you know, you got to cut him a break if he does in terms of throwing inaccuracy and, and also sticking his hand in there uh, for handoffs and different things. He's not going to be 100%. And the other thing you have to factor in is how good, I don't care if you're a Peyton Manning, and we all know, or Tom Brady, uh, can you as a rookie quarterback come into this league and not practice for the week or t the full complement of practice for the two weeks leading up to the game and then light it up, the game just isn't that easy, even if he plays. So certainly we're going to be downgrading Trey Lance in any potential performance this week. Not to put you on the spot, but long term, how long do you think it would take him to actually get back to 100% after that sort of injury? Well, 100% is probably going to be six weeks. But I think by this next week, I would expect him to start working his way into slinging the ball and working his way into things. Uh, and, you know, once again, gradually get stronger and stronger and better and better kind of thing. The difficulty there is with the index fingers. Look, if it's the fourth or fifth or something, you can buddy tape it and still go. You can't buddy tape your index finger and then throw the ball. I mean, right? It just right, doesn't right. work that way. All right, last one here, Carson Wentz. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the weird five to 12 week timetable. He had returned to practice. He officially is going to start now on Sunday here. So again, I th think what I remember you saying is that he can return in five weeks if everything kind of goes well, but you didn't think that there was any way that he would be absolutely 100%. As Ursay had said, he would need to be necessarily if they want to start him. So he's returning. So is it fair to still say that you don't necessarily think that he is absolutely 100%. And if not, assuming not, can he still be an effective quarterback in week one? Yeah, this is why I love doing the podcast with you. You're on everything and you set the table right and there's you, you understand what's happening. So I said all along, he's not starting based on the fact that even if he heals quickly, he won't be 100% because that's what the Colts were saying. And because in the past, he's gotten into trouble by playing when he's not 100%. So I get why they said that. But last week, I actually flipped on my podcast and elsewhere saying, Carson Wentz will be the starter. Now, I didn't change my mind about injury. I don't think he's 100%. But here's why. Let's play this out. Sam Ellinger is why Carson Wentz is the starter. And you're gonna, your listeners are going to say, Doc's off his rocker. <laughs> Taking out some of the hooch. But here's why. Sam Ellinger, ACL sprain, going to miss a month. He's the number three. Eason, the number two. Okay, he starts for the Colts because Wentz isn't 100%. Who's the backup? Hunley? He doesn't really even know the offense. There's no NFL team that wants to go into a game saying, okay, if the starter's out, we're in trouble, Right? Unless you're the Denver Broncos last year where you just had no quarterbacks, right? So then you make Carson Wentz at 90 or 95% the backup. But how silly does that look to have Carson Wentz on the field dressed, but you're not playing him? So that's why now Carson's starting. Because of the Sam Ellinger injury, the Colts had to come off the, he has to be 100% to play. Now the Colts and Wentz will all profess he is 100%. That's why he's playing. I don't buy it. But look. Carson has shown that he's recovered quickly. I'll give that to him. Can he play? Yes. He's just not 100%. Look, how will he play? Some of it is how much time off he's had. Rust, it's still a new system, new team for him, even though he's with reunited with Frank Wright. The foot will slow him down some, but he's going to be able to be effective. Like last night, Dak Prescott. Everyone's like, oh my God, what a great performance for Dak Prescott. I agree. Great recovery, great performance. I don't think there were a couple of throws he didn't step into, yeah, push down yeah. the field. And when he was moving, I don't think he was that Prescott moving. There's still a little rust. Oh, my God, what a great game. But there's no way you can tell me Dak Prescott was 100%. So Carson Wentz, 
could have a great game, but I think he'll have a little bit of a harder time because of lack of practice, new system, new team, and his foot won't be necessarily 100%. But he can be effective, and he is going to start. Doc, you are second to none with all of this. I learned so much every time we talk very quickly. Tell everybody where they can find more of you and your work. Well, right now at Twitter, ProFootballDoc and ProFootballDoc.com, but we have some really exciting things coming up, hopefully within a month here. But look at the website for six scores. That's the new thing. We used to grade the teams by letter grades, but we refined our formula and grading system where now it's to a decimal point number and uh, algorithms as we get better and better at what we do and uh, use it for fantasy stuff, DFS stuff, wagering stuff, whatever you want. We don't tell you who to pick. You form your opinions as to what it is, and then you see if it matches up and it strengthens your opinion or maybe makes you think twice. That's what we're trying to do, just give you a tool for you to think for yourself and make decisions. Yeah, it's fantastic over there. Everybody should check it out. I'll talk to you again next week. In the meantime, we're going to now go into a game-by-game breakdown with Dan and Kyle in the morning. Be right there. All right, guys, here we are. It is time for Dan and Kyle in the morning. Yates, we're back. How you doing? We're back, buddy. Oh, man. Uh, Week one is off to a fantastic start. That game last night was just absolutely incredible. I am in a fantastic mood because of that. And then now we have Dan and Kyle in the morning back for week one. Man, I'm just so happy right now. I really hope you guys enjoy the show as much as we do because we fought for this show, right? Like we were talking about what the lineup was going to be and Yates and I kind of drew a line in the sand and said, well, we have to do Dan and Kyle in the morning yep. on Fridays. So if you don't enjoy it, I'm sorry, you're out of luck because you're going to be dealing with this all season long. Um, all right. So in case you are new to the podcast, welcome. Thank you for joining us. The Friday podcast is a game by game breakdown of everything that we are going to see this weekend. Yates and I go through all our starts, all our sits. So it's basically a, you know, a companion to the Wednesday show. Uh, there's going to be a lot of good-natured insults. Gates and I are very fond of each other, but this is just kind of how our jam is. And we are going to recap last night's game, and we have a lot to get to, so I'm going to get right to it. And I'm going to start with the winner of our August giveaway, Matt C. from Oklahoma. Congratulations, you have won the signed Clyde edwards Lair helmet. If you entered and you did not win, that's okay. You are automatically entered into the September giveaway, which is a signed Kyler Murray football. You know how to enter by now. All you got to do is leave a review for the show on Apple Podcasts or CastBox. Go to fantasypros.com slash contest. If you are a subscriber to our YouTube channel, which you really should be, we put out a ton of great content. The graphics for this show, our senior video producer, Chris, has gone nuts with them. It's going to look great. Again, youtube.com slash fantasypros. If you are a subscriber, three times the entries into the contest. There is no reason to not be one. Uh, again, that's youtube.com, sorry, slash fantasy pros. Now, like last year, Yates, remember we started with the accuracy challenge. That's something that we do on our site. It is sponsored by Caesars. You can win a ton of great prizes just by taking 10 fantasy point over unders. Again, fantasypros.com slash challenge, and that is sponsored by Caesars. So, Yates, I'm going to run through the 10 players right now. Fantasy points, half PPR. You tell me whether you're going over or under. Are you ready? Yes. Jalen Hurts against Atlanta, 20.4 fantasy points. I'm going the over here. I've got him for 22.7. I'm also going over Trevor Lawrence against Houston, 18.8 fantasy points. This one's closer, uh, but I will still take the over here, even though it is week one for a rookie quarterback. This is the Houston Texans. You start your quarterbacks against them. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I'm actually very excited to see this game. Yep. Uh, Najee Harris against Buffalo, 15 fantasy points. Uh, I will take the over here, but it is again, it's not by much. Uh, I think that Pittsburgh is going to be is going to lean on Najee Harris in this one with the secondary as good as it is for the Buffalo Bills. So I will go uh, the over here as well. Yeah, I do think he's going to get a lot of work, but I have him slightly under, so I'll go under there. Damian Harris against Miami, 11.5 fantasy points. This one I'll take the under, uh, just because I don't know what the goal line work is going to be here in New England. Is it going to be Ramondre Stevenson? Uh, if if it is, then Damian Harris is going to have to be super, super efficient with his workload, so I will take the under. Yeah, he needs the touchdown to get here, almost certainly, and I I don't want to project it. So I'm going under Calvin Ridley against Philadelphia. We, whatever it is, over, right? Yeah. Uh, six, yep. 16.5 fantasy points. Yeah, he's going to be fantastic. I agree with you. Jamar Chase against Minnesota, 10 fantasy points. This is an interesting line. I feel like this is really, really close because I could easily see a path for how he finishes over here, but I just can't buy in yet. I need to see it first, so I will take the under. 
I agree with you. Jerry Judy against the Giants, 10 and a half fantasy points. I will take the over here. I have, I've talked about it on the Wednesday start sit that I have concerns about just, are they actually going to need Jerry Judy in this game to win? Uh, I really don't think that they're going to, uh, going to need him a ton, but I will take the over here. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tough matchup too with the cornerbacks there. I'll go under slightly. Justin Jefferson against Cincinnati, 15 fantasy points. I will take the over here. You look at that Minnesota receiving core, it's Jefferson, it's Thielen, and then no one else. So the ball's got to go to Jefferson and Thielen. I really want to know this one. Yes, I'll agree with you on that one, by the way. Corey Davis against Carolina, 9.7 fantasy points. Yeah, I'm easily taking the over here on this one. That's my guy. Me too. Kyle Pitts, finally, Philadelphia, 10.3 fantasy points, Yates. Oh, man. Uh, Let's have some fun here. Let's go over. I like it. I'll go over as well. All right. As I said, this is Friday morning. We don't necessarily know the practice reports from Friday. We will do our best to qualify. But let's start, as we always do, with the Thursday night game and recap it real quick. This one has so much to talk about, Yates. I will try to move. Bucks 31, Cowboys 29, Tom Brady 32 for 50, 379 yards, Four touchdowns, two interceptions, neither one of which was really his right. fault. I look forward to him playing into perpetuity. I don't think we really need to break it down, but let let us break down the receiving game. I did a radio spot uh, with our good friend Matt Peralt on the betting pro side, and they were asking me about some DFS plays and who would be in the captain's chair for the showdown. And I had Antonio Brown there, seven targets, five catches, 121 yards, and a touchdown. That's a reminder, by the way, with the DFS if you use one of our offers, you know, the where you deposited, you know, however much it was at fantasypros.com slash offers, and you got a six month subscription, use that money. Like this is prime time to play DFS. You can really take advantage of the prices on whatever site, Yahoo or Fandle or whatever you got. Make sure you play in a contest so you can get going. Anyway, keeping going, Chris Godwin, 14 targets, nine catches, 105 yards and a touchdown. Narrowly missed another long one. Gronk catches all eight of his targets for 90 yards and the scores. Mike Evans, Six targets, three catches, just 24 yards. What do you got, Yates? What's your big takeaway here from the receiving game? The big takeaway starts with Mike Evans because he was the first Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver to be drafted. Now, you had Godwin and Evans back-to-back in ADP and ECR, but I was a lot lower on Evans than consensus for this very reason. Every bust video that I did, players to avoid, whatever, had Evans in it because at that price tag, you you weren't going to get the consistent usage out of Mike Evans and the consistent volume that you need at that price tag at what you spent that pick on. So with Mike Evans, he's going to be fine. Don't panic. Don't trade him away just yet. He's going to have these up and down games, but you need to readjust your expectations for him to be a wide receiver two rather than a wide receiver one locked in option for your roster. So I think moving forward, he's going to have some up and down games. He's going to be, he's going to provide some two touchdown performances but he's going to take a back seat to Chris Godwin and Antonio Brown, who AB looked fantastic. I mean, just an absolute value in drafts. And Joe, I got to give Joe a lot of credit here. I hate doing it, but I got to give Joe a lot of credit for saying like, if we, and he was the one who was driving this train saying like, if there, if we're projecting this to be a more well-balanced target share in this offense, than you know, than what we anticipate with Evans and Godwin up at the top, if we're projecting that it's going to be more well-balanced, why wouldn't you just take the value of Antonio Brown, who was going around like wide receiver 40 off the board in, in pre-draft right. ADP, and it paid off in a big way. This was a fantastic matchup for opposing wide receivers. Antonio Brown and Chris Godwin absolutely took advantage of it. Yeah, I will say, too, you know, Evans, not it wouldn't have been a good game, really, probably regardless, but he was very close at the end of that game, right? The, the uh, cornerback, whoever it was, got the fingertip on it, barely knocked it off. He could have had a much more respectable game, but I agree. I did a player 10 players you'll regret drafting list, I believe, for a video for our YouTube channel. I believe the number one player was Mike Evans just yep. because of where he was going. Again, fine player, totally fine to have in your roster. But yeah, AB looked great. And Gronk, I, I mean, I, I... I did not see this coming. I did not. Eight targets, though. I mean, that's the thing. Like, he's productive, fine. You want to catch a touchdown, it's fine. He looked fantastic. Again, this was a game where the Bucks needed a ton of points. I don't know that it's always going to be that way. We'll talk about the Cowboys in a second. Dak looked great. But somebody, you know, who we probably should be worried about, and this is my favorite part of football season when you and I are messaging <laughs> each other during the game, which was as soon as Ronald Jones fumbled, uh, we said, bye, Ronald Jones. And then Leonard Fournette, unfortunately, on the next play, didn't uh, catch the uh, this pass was, from Brady. This was so fantastic. Like, literally, the timing of this could not have been better. And I was, I was in my living room <laughs> cackling at this. So, literally, like, 30 seconds before uh leonard fournette had the tipped pass like the tip pass that led to an interception i said with ronald jones because you had messaged you said bye ronald jones 30 seconds before leonard fournette has that happen i said yeah he's gone 
And then <laughs> immediately after that, Leonard Fournette and you respond immediately by Leonard Fournette. And at the same <laughs> time, I said, never mind. <laughs> so just so fantastic. The timing of it was just I, mean, I This Bucks backfield, I don't know, man. I thought it was Ronald Jones. The first series, Leonard Fournette comes out, and I'm like, crap, I was way yep. too low on Ronald or on Leonard Fournette. And then Jones fumbled. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, man. I didn't see Jones the rest of the game. So I, we're doing this in the morning. That game ended late. I was writing the article, which you should check out, by the way, my week one fantasy guide. Uh, so I've not had a chance yet to see, but I don't remember seeing him after that whatsoever, which it does not surprise me in any way, shape, or form. There was a point last year, Yates, where Ronald Jones had kind of gotten beyond that. He had fumbled in the game. I was like, all right, goodbye, see you later. And then he just came right back in. But right. he is now back to this point. This is why I want neither one of them. Uh, Fournette winds up with an okay game, nine for 32 on the ground, seven targets, five catches, a big catch too that uh, you know Collinsworth was talking about would be like the play of the game for 27 yards, but who knows what we're going to see next week. I'm just completely avoiding both these guys. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Fournette's the guy that I want now, but that's still relative. It's all gross. Uh, for the Cowboys, I mean, Dak, talk about answering the bell, man, with Goodness. this one. He he hung in there the whole game. Like, forget about the shoulder. He just hung in there, which is hard to do when you have a big injury like he had at the end of last year that ended the season. 42 for 58. That's a lot of pass attempts. <laughs> they just basically said, we can't run the ball. We're not even going to pretend like we're going to try here, which we'll also talk about in a second. 403 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Amari Cooper, man, all the injury concerns. 16 targets, 13 catches, 139 yards, and two touchdowns. He looked great. C.D. Lamb, 15 targets, seven catches, 104 yards, and a touchdown. Michael Gallup looked very good early. Seven catches, four, uh, seven targets, four catches, 36 yards. But then he left with an angle injury. I, it doesn't seem that serious, but he obviously was uh, out for the rest of the game. Just takeaways here, Yates, on the on the Cowboys wide receivers. So, I mean, we were a little bit lower. We talked about in a Discord stages, which you need to join our Discord channel over at fantasypros.com slash chat. Dan and I did a Discord stages with... Uh, a lot of our audience yesterday and we were talking about Amari Cooper and I think I had him I ended up with him at 21 on the week and I think you had him around that same range yeah it, and it was just because well okay you know it's a tough matchup here you know and and Sean Murphy Bunting going out with that injury certainly didn't help um certainly didn't help the uh the secondary there in Tampa Bay but you know we did not foresee Dallas throwing the ball 58 times. So yeah, when you have that type of pass volume, Cooper is going to eat and CD lamb is going to eat. And yeah. so that, you know, we definitely did not see that coming. And if that is going to be the case moving forward where they're going to lean on their passing game. Now I'm not projecting that. I'm not projecting that they're going to throw the ball regularly above 40 times per game, but this offense was cooking and Dak yeah. coming back as quickly as he did. And they leaned on him heavily. Now he didn't have the same type of zip, on his passes Correct. as we have seen from him previously. So I think that will come along as he continues to progress from uh, from the injury, but still looked fantastic. He is a top five fantasy quarterback moving forward if this offense is going to look as good as it did last night. Yates, you asked me whether or not you could uh, check out the players and how often Zeke has been traded in four teams that have been imported into our My Playbook feature, which you should, by the way, because it's got a million amazing tools, including the autopilot feature, which will set your best lineup for you if you can't. 11 for 33 on the ground, two targets, caught both of them for just six yards through the air. A lot of Tony Pollard in this game. They just couldn't run the ball. They didn't even really try. So are you panicking on Zeke? Is this basically a, we knew this was going to be a horrible matchup. I don't really care. I'm fine with him going forward. Yep. We knew this was going to be a tough matchup. I put out four days ago on Twitter, a tweet saying, uh, put this in your back pocket for right now. Go trade for Ezekiel Elliott in every format after week one. He's going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers run defense, was an, which was just an absolutely brutal matchup for opposing fantasy running backs last year. And there are people who are going to, who drafted Zeke, not necessarily with full confidence, right? Even though they drafted him with a high first round pick, it wasn't necessarily with a full vote of confidence. Uh, looking back at what he did last year, then you have this type of performance people are going to be panicking now maybe not in the like hard and heavy like money leagues and stuff like that but in your mm -hmm. casual leagues which a lot of people which is a lot of our audience there are going to be fantasy managers in your league that are panicking about ezekiel elliott go buy low right now because his schedule moving forward is fantastic he looked good like he did not look like he was running in mud or anything like that it's a very very tough defense and kellen moore the offensive coordinator for the dallas cowboys was just like we're not going to even try it. We're going to pass the ball, which we can do successfully here. And it worked. They kept, uh, they covered the spread here. So I think that uh, moving forward, I'm not panicking on, on Ezekiel Elliott at all. I'm looking to go acquire him. And very quickly, I completely agree with you, by the way, upcoming schedule for Dallas Chargers, Philadelphia, 
Carolina, Giants. It, it's not going to be this way. This is basically the toughest matchup he could have. P.S. He probably would have scored a touchdown if Blake Jarwin could have yep. successfully yep. thrown a block right by the end zone. That he missed it. And let's very briefly, before we get into the games this weekend, talk about the tight end situation because this is something where we thought both Schultz and Jarwin might, you know, take away from each other. And they did, but it was Schultz who caught all six of his targets for 45 yards. Jarwin had four targets as well, three catches, just 20 yards. But it really, that uh, an egregious missed block. I, he barely even tried, basically, around the goal line that cost Zeke that touchdown. It, are either Is either tight end worth rostering going forward? Uh, in my Week 1 Fantasy Projections article, which you can check over uh, check out at FantasyPros.com, I talked about this this tight end group. And I said, one of these guys, if they were the clear starter would absolutely be fantasy relevant. There would be a top 12 tight end because of the offense that they play in and how much they pass the ball. But when you have a near even split, as far as they, uh, uh, like they did last night, you're betting. Yeah. He ended up with six targets, four targets, which is fine for fantasy purposes, but they threw the ball 58 times. So (laughs) that's not going to happen moving forward. So I really, unless one of these guys misses time with an injury or one just clearly takes over, you really don't want to be rostering any of these guys. Yeah, I mentioned in the preseason that if we, if you had like, you know, some leagues have team quarterbacks where whoever the quarterback is, you just get the production. If you could have team tight ends, right. you like the Dallas Cowboys team tight end would be great. But individually, I really don't want uh, any of them. All right, Yates, let's get into all the games from this weekend. We will move at lightning, ludicrous speed. Okay, Yates, let's go. Eagles taking on the Falcons uh, for the Eagles. You're starting Hurts, I assume, in this game, correct? Yes, absolutely. A top 10 option. Wonderful. Miles Sanders, I mean, we had some questions about him, but I feel like in this game you're willing to roll with him as a low-end RB2 maybe? Yeah, low-end RB2. The concern here is that Atlanta was actually pretty solid against opposing running backs for fantasy purposes last year, but it was because that just teams could pass all over Atlanta, so they really <laughs> didn't need to run the ball. So it skews the numbers there a little bit. Pass-catching running backs out of the backfield here are fantastic, but... Uh, against Atlanta, but I have concerns about whether or not that's actually going to be Miles Sanders' role here. So Sanders will be fine. Uh, He'll see enough work and have be efficient enough to return low-end RB2 value, but you're hoping that he finds the end zone in this one. Kind of sticking true to my pre-draft rankings here with Miles Sanders. Which running back do you prefer in this game? Is it Sanders or is it Davis? Uh, I have Mike Davis slightly ahead. I literally have them back-to-back, actually. I have Mike Davis at 19 and Miles Sanders at 20. Beautiful. I have Mike Davis at 18, so you're crazy. And I also have Miles Sanders at 20. All right, fine. We see things the same way. Are you rolling with Dallas Goddard in this game? Obviously, Zach Ertz was not traded. He is still there. Don't really know how you feel about this Philadelphia tight end situation. I talked about it on the Start Sit episode on Wednesday that like once you get past tight end 8, tight end 9 in my in my rankings, you're really just throwing all the guys from like 10 to 18 in one sort of cluster and you just which you shake it out whichever one comes out highest that I'm not really going to be surprised so Dallas Goddard is in that grouping you're playing him because you drafted him where you did uh I think he has a cap ceiling though with Zach Ertz here in on this roster still so uh Dallas Goddard you can start him just based on the nature of the tight end position and how gross it is but I'm not expecting great things from him yeah, I'm not expecting great things from most tight ends this weekend, unfortunately, right. or any weekend. So I am starting Goddard. He actually slots in right now as my tight end eight. That doesn't mean a whole lot because the projections for him are still something where you're going to be like, okay, fine, I'll accept it. But he is somebody who I am starting in this matchup. The other guy, Yates, on the Eagles, who we get a lot of questions about is Devonta Smith. What do you think in this first week? Yeah, with Devonta Smith, I, I think that you can roll him out as a flex option uh, or a low-end wide receiver three. It's a great matchup. It is a fantastic matchup for opposing wide receivers, but I just don't have that full vote of confidence yet in Devonta Smith. You know, he looked great in the preseason, but I want to see what this offense looks like under Nick Sirianni, right, uh, with Jalen Hurts at, at quarterback. So, I, you can start Devonte Smith. Uh, I think that it's a, the matchup. Uh, p- everything points to that you can start him, but I'm not going crazy with him. Yeah, I think we're seeing this the same way. Ideally, I'm sitting uh, Devonta Smith because, I, again, I think we're both saying we want to see this first. Like, I love Jalen Hurts mostly for his legs, not necessarily his arm. He could have a big game here against Atlanta, but it is something where if he does have a big game and it's on my bench, I can live with that because then at least I'll feel confident rest of the season. Yep. Anybody else here who you want to start uh, on the Eagles? You've got Zach Ertz, you got Jalen Rager, anybody else here? Consider? No, and just for context, I've got Devontae Smith at wide receiver 38 in my rankings this week. Yeah, I am at 39, exactly. And again, it's something where I could see myself starting him, you know, if I'm in a pinch necessarily. Right. But ideally, I'm looking to get away from him. So nobody else, right? No nope. Eagles. How about the Falcons here? We just talked about Mike Davis. We're starting him both as kind of a mid-tier, low-end 
RB2, you're obviously starting Calvin Ridley. You are obviously starting Kyle Pitts, correct? I yeah. mean, full yep. go. Absolutely. Wonderful. Based on where you drafted these guys, you've got to start them. And what about Matt Ryan here? I mean, it's a matchup. You know, he he comes out for me. It's, I, I will I will just put it out there as my QB 13 right now. So it, it's something where, you know, in a 14-team league, I'd start him. Even in a 12-team league, if you missed, I might be able to get away with him. What do you think of him this week? You're completely crazy. You're way too high on Matt Ryan. I've got him at 14 on the week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew that was coming, my friend. Okay, yeah, so we both like him. What about Russell Gage uh, at this point? I mean, it's a good matchup, right? He'll probably go up against um, Avante Maddox, so... You know, not bad, but are you starting Russell Gage in this one? I'm not. Uh, again, based on, we're at the weird point where it's like where you drafted these guys, you're typically just kind of slotting those in as your starting options in week one, unless you're in the flex conversation. So, or unless you've dealt with injury up to this point. So I think with Russell Gage, he's a low end flex option for me. I'm not really expecting a ton here. I don't want to start him, uh, but I, I can if I'm in a pinch. Yeah, he's beyond that for me. I'm, I'm really not considering him. Right now, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a decent game. I do want to see what this is. But you're right. Week one especially is very much of where I drafted these guys is kind of what I'm thinking about them coming into the year. And for me, Gage was a guy who was more of a bench uh, receiver for me. So he's a sit for me. Let's get to the Steelers and the Bills. We just talked about Najee Harris. You like him this week. Context, where does he actually slot in on your running back rankings? Yeah, I was surprised with Najee Harris and where he ended up in my rankings. I've got him at RB6 on the week. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty high. So are you start? I mean, I know you don't have to choose this necessarily, but are you starting him over Aaron Jones against the Saints? It, they're back to back and I've been flip flopping those guys all week. Uh, so I think with, you definitely can start Aaron Jones over Najee Harris and I'm not going to blink, uh, but Najee Harris ends up at RB6, Aaron Jones at RB7. Can't imagine anybody is having to choose between right. those guys. You right. probably have both, but still that's good context to put in. Okay. Very good. I'm a little lower on him. I have him right now at 11. But uh, again, that's somebody who's obviously a must start. What about the receivers here? I mean, the Bills' strength, obviously, is their pass defense. Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, Juju Smith-Schuster, who I know you had some pretty strong uh, opinions about in the preseason. How do you feel about all these guys? Yeah, so with Chase Claypool, I've got him at wide receiver 29 on the week. I've got Deontay Johnson at wide receiver 30. And then I've got Juju Smith-Schuster. I am still scrolling. I've got him at 51 on the week. Oh, so my I think with uh, you're going to see you know the, the targets funnel to Chase Claypool and Deontay Johnson first. Juju Smith-Schuster has to be a lot more efficient than what he has been in the past uh, to be able to finish, or he's got to find the end zone to finish higher than that as a flex-worthy option. So again, where you drafted him, I was a lot lower on Juju. I was telling people not to draft him near his ADP. So where you drafted him, you probably have to start him as a wide receiver three, a low-end flex option. But I've got Najee Harris all the way up at six because I do believe that the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to lean into the run game this week versus trying to have Ben throw it 40-plus times. So... If that's the case, then Juju just doesn't have enough volume. Yeah, I've got all of these guys as starts for me. I've got Juju the lowest, but he is 34th for me because I do think as bad of a matchup as it is, generally speaking, I don't think they're just going to be able to run the rock 35 times with Najee. And I get that that's what they probably want to do, but the Bills are going to put up points, like as good as the Steelers' defense is. I still think that that you know what we saw last year from you know the Bills' offense and how efficient it was, I think it's going to continue right now. So I think there will be enough volume to start all these guys, but you're right. For me, they're all wide receiver threes, and I have them a little bit in the same range. I assume that's it, though, for the Bills. You're not uh, for the uh, Steelers. Pardon me. You're not starting Ben Roethlisberger or Eric Ebron or your best friend Pat Fryer, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not looking to start Ben. Uh, definitely not looking to start Ebron. I am watching Pat Fryermuth. I'm not starting yeah. him this week, but I am watching Fryermuth in this game. If he comes out as a starter in 11 personnel here uh, because of his blocking ability, then he's going to have t- opportunity to become the tight end one in this offense, <clears throat> which is a very valuable role for fantasy. So I'm watching that one closely. Yeah, I only <clears throat> mentioned him because I know you would right. riot if I didn't mention him. He's not really under consideration for anybody to start right now. How about the Bills here? You're, of course, you're starting Josh Allen. Of course, you're starting Stephon Diggs. Are you starting anybody else in the Bills? No, I'm watching Gabriel Davis. I'm watching to see how this target share breaks down after Stefan Diggs uh, and what the trickle down effect is. But Gabriel Davis, I'm a lot. I've been a lot higher on uh, than consensus here this entire offseason. I think he's going to be a very valuable flex play moving forward. But in Week One, up against the Pittsburgh Steelers' pass defense, I'm not looking to start him here. I'm certainly not starting any running back. I'm not starting any other wide receiver, even though everybody is well aware of my great (laughs) love for Emmanuel Sanders. He is not close to being a startable option in this game. So move on. Let's get to the Bengals and the Vikings. Bengals, uh, you are starting Joe Mixon, of course, right? Yes, I've got him at RB5 on the week. 
How about the wide receivers? All three of them, Yates, what do you think? Uh, T. Higgins for sure is in my starting lineup. I've got Higgins at 20 on the week. I have Tyler Boyd at wide receiver 34 on the week. I think he's going to be a very, very safe wide receiver three. He gets a bump up in full PPR formats. And yep. then I've got Jamar Chase at wide receiver 43 on the week. So I think that he's one of these guys that, again, I'm going to be watching pretty closely. I'm going to be waiting to see what he does and how he looks in an NFL game with Joe Burrow. Uh, because that was part of the allure with Jamar Chase was that he was reunited with the quarterback who helped him put up the dominant numbers that he did in 2019. So I'm going to be watching that, but I'm not looking to start Jamar Chase if I can avoid it. Yeah, I have him right now. He's thoughts in at 37 for me, but I don't feel great about it. Like he's a guy who this is where it comes out when you get to that range. Right. So that's a basically a startable flex option for me. But it's also not somebody who I'm dying to start. I would much rather wait and see. I am fine, as you mentioned also. I have a Boyd a little higher than you and Higgins a couple spots lower than you. But we're in the same range, essentially. I would start both of them without question. How about Burrow? A lot of people drafted Burrow to be their starter. Are you starting him in this game? Uh, you can. Uh, I'm not expecting crazy things. Uh, so I've got Joe Burrow at QB 15 on the week uh, with like Kirk Cousins, Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, all in that same range. So any of those guys that you want to start over Joe Burrow or, you know, choosing to start over Joe Burrow, I'm I'm not going to fight you on that. Uh, but Burrow, I think that you can get away with. I just don't I, I don't know. Like he ends up at yeah. 15 because of the projections. But there's a wide range of outcomes here with Burrow in his first game back from that major knee injury. Yeah, this is uh, I. It's disconcerting how eye to eye we are right now on on all of these. I also have Joe Burrow at 15. Everybody knows how I feel about him. I, I hope that he is mentally recovered from the injury, but my guess is going to take a few games. And I assume CJ Uzama, you are out on, correct? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I just had to mention it. Doesn't matter. Vikings. You're obviously starting Dalvin Cook. You are starting Justin Jefferson. How about Adam Thielen, a guy who we were kind of like drafting essentially as a wide receiver too but very touchdown dependent are you starting him here yeah i definitely think that you should be starting adam thielen in this matchup uh, the cincinnati Bengals are a fine matchup for opposing wide receivers and again i talked about it with justin jefferson in that over under challenge it's like where's the ball gonna go you've got dalvin right. cook of course who's gonna just run wild in this one but then it's Justin Jefferson, it's Adam Thielen, and then you're looking at guys like Amir Smith-Marset, Chad Beebe, uh, and then Tyler Conklin, and maybe Chris Herndon at the tight end position. Like, the ball's not going to go to them. Uh, it's going to go to Adam Thielen, and it's going to go to Justin Jefferson. So I've got Thielen at wide receiver 17 on the week. Yeah, I have him at 14. I, and yeah. it's uncomfortable to have him that high. Right. Because he's, but you're absolutely right. The ball's got to go somewhere. And this is really what we're looking at. So my guess is this is probably about the peak of where I will be ranking Adam Thielen all season. But for this one, especially, I am starting with confidence. You mentioned already Cousins kind of on that borderline, like in deeper leagues, whatever. And you mentioned Conklin. I assume you're not starting him. No, no. Okay, let's get to the Lions against the 49ers for the Lions. I mean, TJ Hawkinson, you're basically starting every week if you drafted him, regardless of how you feel about it, I assume. And what about DeAndre Swift, though, here in a kind of a tough matchup, obviously? Uh, it was fun on the uh, Wednesday Start Sit show. Andrew Erickson, who's going to be joining us this season uh, from yep. PFF, he was very high on DeAndre yep. Swift. I mm -hmm. was not. Uh, I have DeAndre Swift at RB. Well, he was at RB24. He has moved up to RB21, which is some of the recent news that he is reportedly a full go uh, and receiving yep. a full workload. So, Yes, I think he's going to be he's going to be fine. Uh, he's going to receive some work here, but this matchup is just absolutely brutal. I'm not expecting anything great from the Detroit Lions offense in this one. So DeAndre Swift, RB21 for me. You can start him if you need to. Yeah, he's 22 for me. Um, so I agree. He's a guy who, if I drafted him, I am starting him in this. And again, they will almost certainly play from behind. That's good in terms of game script for what we're going to see for him because he will factor into the passing game. But yeah, I always thought that it was so overblown about what he was going to be like in week one. So if you drafted him, I'd start him. What about anybody else? Obviously not Jared Goff. No. Obviously not Tyrell Williams. What about Jamal Williams in this one? Uh, no. Uh, tough matchup. He falls outside my top 30 running backs on the week. He does for me as well, not one that you want to target. For the 49ers, this seems like all systems go for me. Raheem Mostert, obviously George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, I'm very high on right now, as I am Debo Samuel. We talked about on the stages yesterday. I'm a little higher than you are, I think, yep. on these guys, because I think you're a little concerned about the volume. And Trey Sermon in this one. So whoever you kind of want to point out here, what do you think? You're starting all of them, I assume. Though. Yeah, okay. So I've got Raheem Mostert at RB13 on the week. If you've got Raheem Mostert, wow. start him this week uh, <laughs> against Detroit. He's going to, uh, I've joked about it, 150 yards minimum and two touchdowns minimum uh and then i've got trey sermon as a, a flex option here i've got him at rb 31 so he's right on okay. that that borderline where you can start him if you need to i think the game script is the narrative that i am buying into here 
with Trey Sermon and Raheem Mostert, saying that both of these guys are going to see some work here in this one. And it's a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic matchup for opposing running backs. With George Kittle, I'm, yeah, top three option every single week. Like, we know yep. the ball's going his way. I have Ayuk and Debo Samuel a little bit lower because my concern here is that we see San Francisco pull a what they did in the NFC Championship game against the mm -hmm. Green Bay Packers a couple of years ago, where Jimmy Garoppolo, what he threw the ball seven times in that one just because <laughs> the running game was working. And so it's going like, spoiler alert, the running game is going to work here in this one. So Jimmy Garoppolo, I think he's, uh, Garoppolo is a fine QB2 option, right? Like Or two QB option uh, as a low end QB2. But then the concern here is just like, okay, well, if San Francisco goes up big in the first quarter, then are they actually going to need Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel? Uh, so I've got Ayuk at 25, and then I've got Debo Samuel at 32. So there's still options that you can start. However, when I'm starting them, I'm not necessarily expecting top 12 production from them. That's why they're a little bit lower in my rankings. Yeah, uh, right now I have Ayuk at 15, which I mentioned yesterday. Ooh. Again, I complete, I get the concerns, absolutely. And Debo, by the way, is 26 for me. So I'm higher on both of them. Totally understand the concerns. I think the other part of it that I'm more considering is that there is the part where Jimmy Garoppolo has his job completely threatened sure. and he's going to sure. lose it. And I, I imagine that he's going to try to at least make a little bit of a point. And I also think that you can take a very short pass for either Ayuk or uh, Debo Samuel and right. take it to the house and have a huge game. So I'm a little bit, it's interesting though, you know, when we rank guys, our rankings lock for the Thursday games, of course. And I had Lamb, Evans, Godwin, and Cooper straight through from 16 to 19. So if I move Ayuk down one spot right now, he goes to uh, right. wide receiver 20. Right. So it's a little funny. So I don't know exactly where he's going to end up, but I am high on everybody. I'm a little lower somehow on Mostert than you are. 13 is, is aggressive for me. I am right now at 19. Again, probably plus or minus two by the time I'm all done with it and I redo my projections on Saturday night. And Sermon a little higher because I think that he will go there. Titans and Cardinals, start everybody. Uh, Titans, Ryan Tannehill, you are starting. A.J. Brown, you are starting. Julio Jones, you are starting. Derrick Henry, you are starting. How high do you have Julio Jones is my real question here, Yates. Uh, I have both A.J. Brown and Julio Jones as top 10 options on the week. Correct. That is the correct answer. Julio Jones slots in at nine for me. Hey, AJ Brown at here. five. Oh, same? Oh. Uh, seven for me with AJ Brown. Get your, get your stuff together, <laughs> But yeah, this is awesome. I, the only Titan that I'm sitting really is Anthony Ferkser. Yeah, I, don't go near. It, all right, fine. For the Cardinals, obviously you are starting Kyler Murray. You are obviously starting DeAndre Hopkins. What about the running backs here, Yates? How do you feel about them? I'm going to avoid them if I can. Uh, with Chase Edmonds, I mean, well, let me qualify. With Chase Edmonds, I've got him inside my top 30. So he okay. he is a fine option that you can roll out as an Counts RB3. Counts as a start, I feel like, right? If yeah, inside, I think yeah. that the okay. threshold for me is like within the top 30 running backs, uh, within the top 40 wide receivers that make it in the flex, right? Uh, within the top 15 quarterbacks, top 15 tight ends. So with, uh, with Chase Edmonds, I've got him at 26. So he is absolutely okay. someone that you can plug into your lineup, but he's not someone that I'm like crazy excited to plug into my lineup. Uh, it's just based on the nature of the running back position and how it is right now. So yeah, with Chase Edmonds, you definitely can look his way. James Conner, I got him at 33. I would prefer to sit him if I can. Yeah, I'm with you. I've got Edmonds a little uh, 27 and James Conner at 36. I do think that there's going to be a lot of scoring in this game. I think there's a decent chance that the Cardinals are going to be playing from behind here on the road, so I could see Edmonds factor into the passing game a little more. I am willing to roll with him at a flex, even in half PBR formats. I'm staying away from James Conner. Anybody else, Yates? I mean, you've got Christian Kirk, you've got AJ Green. The big one that I get a lot of questions about that I recommended a ton in the preseason is Rondell Moore. I am not starting him right now. I am stashing him. What about you? Yeah, same here. Uh, he's someone that you can maybe get away with as a low-end flex option in full PPR formats, but I'm not looking his way just yet. Colts against the Seahawks. There is one start for me on the Colts. It is Jonathan Taylor. Everybody else is a sit. Is that how you feel? No, it's not how I feel. Uh, Michael uh, because Pittman you don't ever want to talk about a wide receiver for the Colts. <laughs> no wide receivers, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, he definitely belongs in your starting lineups this week, guys. Don't listen to what Dan said. Mm. Where do you have him yet? Give me a number. Uh, I have Michael Pittman Jr. at, last time I checked, he was at wide receiver 33. I am double checking now. He is still at wide receiver 33. Okay, I'm avoiding right now. Um, I This is, I imagine, where we would disagree. Sorry, I was tweaking him a little bit. Uh, right now, I'm at 45. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I move him up, you know, maybe up, you know, one or two spots by the time all things are in. But he is going to be outside of wide receiver three range. For me, he's probably not a guy. Maybe in a deep league, at a flex, fine. Look, I need to, I need to see this. I, I need to see Carson Wentz 
who has not had much practice time with these guys, who probably is not 100% healthy, who has a little bit of a banged up offensive line. I need to see it before I'm willing to roll with it. But fine. Everybody else, though, Yates, Wentz, Naeem Hines, Paris Campbell, Zach Paschal, Moali Cox, Jack Doyle, everybody else on your bench, right? Yes, absolutely. Seahawks, this is just kind of going to be what we're doing here. You're obviously starting Russell Wilson. You are starting Chris Carson. You are starting both uh, wide receivers, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, right? Anything you want to say about any of those guys? Uh, it's a tougher matchup for Chris Carson. Uh, the the uh, run, the Indianapolis Colts were a very, very difficult matchup for opposing running backs last year from a fantasy perspective. So Chris mm-hmm. Carson, I've got a little bit, like just adjusting expectations. Uh, so I've got him still as a top 20 running back. You're absolutely still starting him, but he, yep. you just need to adjust your expectations. Otherwise, the only other player, it's just my personal thing. Like I, I'm watching Dwayne Eskridge, D. Eskridge, excuse me, in this sure. one. I yeah, is it D. Eskridge? Are it we supposed D. to call yep. him D. Eskridge now? Yep, it is D. Okay, yep. all right. Because I, I did see that, and I was like, oh, no, have I been doing this wrong the entire time? Um, That's fine. Yeah, obviously, that's a guy that you and I both kind of touted uh, that we wanted to get a piece of, at least in deeper league. So, yeah, let's watch him. What about Gerald Everett, by the way? Because a lot of people kind of missed on tight end. They waited a while. He was a guy who I saw people saying, like, okay, I, I drafted him. He was the last available guy. Not a terrible option, but I assume you're not starting him this week. Right. I would prefer to sit him if I can. I've got him at tight end 18 on the week. Okay, I'm 17. So that that's somebody who in a, in a very deep league or something like that, right. if you're in a pinch, you can get away with. But ideally, you are benching him. Washington football team taking on the Chargers. We are starting Antonio Gibson. We are starting Terry McLaurin. You are always starting Logan Thomas. Any disagreements <laughs> with any of that? Other than always starting Logan Thomas, fine, whatever. But I assume you're on board with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The three guys that you're starting here, Antonio Gibson, Terry McLaurin, Logan Thomas. This is a very low over-under. This is 44 and a half uh, for yep. the over-under. So uh, Vegas is not expecting a ton of points to be put up on the board here. Ryan Fitzpatrick, fine QB2 option. But outside of that, I'm not really looking anywhere, uh, anyone else's way in this in this matchup. Yeah, you got the defenses and you got a cross-country trip, man, for a West Coast team. Oh, like, and- I, I do... Yeah. And Curtis Samuel was a DNP again at yesterday's practice. So he's Correct. unlikely to play this week. Sorry, I didn't even mention. I'm basically throwing him out yet. Yep. I don't think he's going to play next yeah, week. I just he's make battled sure the groin, it. right? No, very good. Curtis Samuel. I assume he's going to be declared out, not even doubtful at this point. But we will see again when we get there. But even if he suits up, I'm not risking it right now, given what happened. I agree with you everywhere. Chargers. How about Justin Herbert Yates? I have him at 12, so I'm still starting him, but I'm not excited about it. I really hate this, that we are agreeing so much. Uh, it's I've got beautiful. It's the, no, it's the worst. Uh, I've got <laughs> Justin Herbert at 12 as well. Very good. Okay, so he's a guy you start, but you got to, again, the phrase we'll use is temper expectations. I had, I had someone ask me on the YouTube live stream that I did yesterday, uh, Justin Herbert or Trevor Lawrence? And I was like, oh, my word. Um, yeah. it was. I've got him back to back. I've got Lawrence at 13. I've got Justin Herbert at 12. I think with Herbert, you just kind of buy into what we saw last year. And just as far as a level of confidence with Trevor Lawrence, though, I would not be surprised if he ends up outscoring Justin Herbert in this one. The Washington defense is just ridiculously so good. good. So, so good. good. Yeah, I agree uh, with that. Act. I mean, I have I mentioned I had Matt Ryan at 13, but I have Lawrence at 14. So look, if that's if you want to go with Lawrence and you're in that position, I, I wouldn't fight you on it. I would personally still start Herbert just because that's kind of how I roll. But I get it. How about Eckler here? Obviously, we have the hamstring thing. We do not know what his status is on Friday. He had mispracticed. The team is optimistic that he plays. Assuming that he suits up Yates, are you starting Austin Eckler? Oh, this is one of those situations where you're going to have to check back on Sunday morning with our YouTube live streams. Like, you're just going to have to because with... Or our Instagram lives, Yates, <laughs> that I do. Uh, right. Yes, you and Will. Uh, <laughs> with uh, with Eckler, I mean, DNP, both the, the past two days here with a hamstring issue. That is not what we want to see, especially because he missed time last year with a hamstring issue so yes. i think with eckler if he does end up starting it depends on what he does in practice here today but if he does end up starting he's probably going to be i'll probably start raheem mostert over him okay I, I mean i think that's fair i i'm probably starting eckler if he does start here and part of the reason is yates the fact that he missed so much time last year with a hamstring injury makes me think that the chargers are not going to put him out there unless they feel relatively comfortable and the team doctors feel relatively comfortable that he's going to be okay. Again, this was not, I mentioned it, this is not an acute injury. Like we don't know when this happened. There wasn't a play that everybody pointed to. Maybe it's just some soreness. I am concerned about it for sure. If he suits up, I am starting him right now. He's my RB 10. My guess is I'm going to move him down a little bit, depending on what happens at practice and Keenan Allen. I assume you are starting in this game and every game. Yeah, I'm not again, I'm not expecting crazy things because the Washington defense is just stacked at every position and they shut down opposing wide receivers last year, but it's still Keenan Allen. The target volume is going to be there. 
that's the thing. I, I don't feel great about Keenan Allen, and that winds up with him at wide receiver 12. That's right. just the way it is right at this time. How about Mike Williams or Jared Cook? Any interest in either no. of those? Nope, none. I'm with you. Panthers against the Jets, the game I will be watching very closely in this one. You've obviously got Christian McCaffrey. How about are you starting both DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson in this one? Absolutely. Uh, you fire up Christian McCaffrey, you fire up Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore. Uh, yeah, I, you got to look at the at these guys with because the Jets secondary here is just uh, Bryce horrific. Hall. Like it's horrific. horrific. Like this is going to be we talk about Houston as the matchup that we want to attack for like opposing running backs and, and really for every uh, position. But and then Detroit as well for opposing running backs. The secondaries the are the uh, secondary for the Jets. You start your wide receivers against them. This is correct. Uh, this is definitely something that you want to attack. For sure. Uh, what about obviously getting a lot of questions about Terrace Marshall? I assume, like me, I'm very intrigued. I want to see, especially even in this matchup, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not throwing in my my starting lineup just yet. No, no, he's someone that you hold onto the on your bench to see what happens here. But I've talked about it where you've got Christian McCaffrey, you've got Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore. They're going to dominate the target share here. So then it's it's Terrace Marshall fighting for the number four option in targets with Dan Arnold, who absolutely is going to be involved. I think in a deeper, deeper, deeper league, mm -hmm. you could look Dan Arnold's way uh, as a sneaky play this week, uh, maybe even in DFS. So. I think that uh, Terrace Marshall, someone that you just want to hold on to your bench and see what happens. Would you rather start Robbie Anderson in this game or Corey Davis? Ooh, that's close. Uh, I have Corey Davis at 23. I have Robbie Anderson at 28. Whoa, I love it. Okay, I do not have Corey Davis that high, although I, I really need to dig into this. He is the only one who I'm starting in this game from the Jets. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, we just got news as we are recording that Jamison Crowder has been ruled out for this game. So oh, Elijah Moore you. is probably going to be starting alongside Keelan Cole. You'll see Elijah Moore in the slot here. Uh, so, it, But I'm still not looking Elijah Moore's way. Uh, not yet. I know he's someone that you have excitement for. You hold on to the bottom of your bench. You see what happens here uh, in week one, but he's not someone that I'm looking to start here, especially because he's missed some time with an injury this, this off season as well. And regardless of the Panthers run defense, you are avoiding all Jets running backs for this week, correct? Yeah, it's just going to be a complete rotation. I've talked about with Michael Carter, you're going to need to be patient. Uh, he's like fourth on the depth chart right now. I think he's going to work his way up. I think he'll see some work in this game, but with Tevin Coleman healthy for now, uh, and then Ty Johnson, it's just, it's not a, that's not a position that I want to attack in fantasy this, this week. Jaguars against the Texans. We mentioned Trevor Lawrence, not a bad option. Even in a 12 team league, you can probably get away with it, but certainly 14 teams or deeper. Yates, I have James Robinson currently as my RB six. Is that insane? Woo uh, no, I love it. Uh, I've got James Robinson at RB 10 on the week. Yeah. Last time I checked. Yeah. RB 10. So He's absolutely a smash play this week. With the uh, with the tweet that I put out about Ezekiel Elliott, I said, guys, we just be prepared because I got a lot of people that were pushing back on it. I said, guys, just be prepared. We're going to see a lot of James Robinson for Ezekiel Elliott trades after week one. It's going to happen. Call. It's going that's to happen. That's a good call. Uh, that's a good call. I will love to make that trade. Uh, how about the receivers here? You've got, you know, LaVisca Chenault. You've got DJ Chark, you've got Marvin Jones starting all three or benching one of them. You definitely can look at all three. I've got LaVisca Chanel at the highest. I've got him at 36 on the week. And then I've got yep. DJ Chark at 39 and then Marvin Jones at 42. So here's the thing with the rookie quarterback, right? We just don't know who he's going to lock onto. He's had an affinity for Marvin Jones throughout the, the uh, preseason. And then we saw LaVisca Chanel be super involved in that last preseason game. So we just don't know who he's going to lock on to. So right now, from a projection standpoint, you kind of just even it out. You just kind of say this target share is probably going to be pretty even, and we'll see what happens. Uh, so if he ends up locking on to LaVisca Chenault, though, this is the matchup where you start these guys as low-end flex plays, low-end wide, three, wide receiver threes, whatever, but one of them will have a fantastic game. We just don't know which one it's going to be right now. Yeah, God, our rankings are so in line right now, which is weird. Like, we haven't talked about this whatsoever so this is really funny i have chenault at 35 i have chark at 38 and i have jones at 42 so almost That's identical crazy. to what you have so yeah i agree I, I really liked what i saw from marvin jones in the preseason but that was without chark i'm, I'm willing to right. kind of wait and see i am starting him in a deeper league in a 14 team league but for the most part i'm trying to get away from it as i assume no james o'shaughnessy or carlos hyde in this never one never right? and never Texans, you're starting Brandon Cooks and no one else. Is that fair? Yep. Brandon Cooks as a wide receiver three. I've got Cooks at 27 and then you run away. Yeah. I have a lot of shares of Brandon Cooks. It just felt like everybody was like, you were on the Texans. I want nothing to do with you. Let me get out of here. And I was like, okay, it's unexciting, but I will take my usual thousand yard season and, and decent right. production and just whatever. But I agree. 
bench everybody else. Chiefs versus Browns. This is a lot of starts in this one, obviously. The Chiefs are basically the same every time. Of course, you're starting Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill and Clyde Edwards-Alaire and Travis Kelsey. What about McCall Hardman? That's a guy who I've gotten a lot of questions about. I assume, like me, it is too risky for you to start him in this first game. Yeah, too risky in this first one. I've got him at 49 on the week. So he okay. just falls outside that flex consideration for me, uh, you know, within the top 48 wide receivers. So I think he's definitely someone that you can look at if you're in a deeper format. But he is just a boomer bust flex option at this point. This is going to be a fantastic game. Oh, I cannot so wait good. to watch this one. Uh, the Brown secondary has improved dramatically this offseason. Yep. So I think what, no one keeps it in, you know, Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill in check, of course. But it's going to be interesting to see how they respond here and what kind of production they put up with the Brown secondary as good as it is on paper. So we'll see. This is going to be a fun, fun one to watch. Half PBR league, you can only start one Clyde Edwards Alaire or Chris Carson. Oh, my word. I think you picked back-to-back running backs in my rankings. Uh, I've got Me Chris too. Carson at 17. I've got Clyde Edwards-Hilaire at 18. Okay, there you go. And again, Demarcus Robinson and Darrell Williams, you are not starting, no. of course, for the Browns. You are starting Nick Chubb, as you always do. Are you starting Odell Beckham Jr. here in his first game back? Yeah, I've got OBJ as a top 24 wide receiver this week. I've got him at 24 right now. Very good. Yeah, I, he, it sounds like all systems go here for him, so I'm yep. excited to see what he can do. Obviously not the greatest matchup. The Chiefs have generally done a good job of limiting wide receivers. Um, so are you starting Jarvis Landry or Kareem Hunt in this one? Well, I talked about LaVisca Chenault, DJ Chark, and Marvin Jones as that, you know, you can consider them. Uh, I've got Jarvis Landry at 37, the right in that same range as these guys. So Jarvis Landry, I think if you're projecting this game to become a shootout, uh, like it potentially could, then Jarvis Landry is going to be a safe option for you. Now, he doesn't, he's one of these guys that you rank in this range, kind of like with LaVisca Chanel, it's different. With LaVisca Chanel, he's like, I, I know what I'm going to get, I think. I'm, I know he's going to have a safe floor, but then he comes with tremendous upside. With Jarvis Landry, it's kind of the same thing as Tyler Boyd. It's like, I know what I'm going to get, but there's very little upside because, you know, he's got to find the end zone, which is very infrequent for a guy like Jarvis Landry or Tyler Boyd. So Landry, wide receiver 37 for me. Okay, so for me, he's 41. So for me, he technically fall. I tried to do like the cutoff of right. top 40 was a start beyond that. So he's technically a sit for me. You can get away with him. And what about Hunt? Uh, yeah, it's, I don't know if you addressed that. Uh, he is outside my top 30 running backs on the week. I would prefer to yep. sit Kareem Hunt if I can. I agree. And one random shout out that I want to make. I kind of feel like you can get away with starting Austin Hooper. Am I crazy this week? I, I was actually really surprised when I ran my projections to see where Hooper ended up. He's at 13 on uh, in my tight end rankings. But again, this is going back to like Dallas Scott, who I've got one spot ahead of him. It's like from nine on or 10 on in my tight end rankings to 18 to 20 or whatever. You know, it's like, I don't care what order these guys are in. So with Hooper, the opportunity is there. The potential is there. But w does he get the guaranteed volume or does it go to Harrison Bryant? Does it go to David Njoku? What, where do the targets go in this one? I think Austin Hooper is a fine play, a fine dart throw that definitely could pay off. But you're also like you're just starting him because it's the tight end position and it's gross. I'm taking a leap. All right, <laughs> I'm going tight end 14. Do it. Patriots against the Dolphins. You are starting Damian Harris and you are starting Johnny Smith. Uh, is that fair to say? Let's start there. Yeah, yeah. I've got Johnny Smith at tight end eight on the week. And then I've got uh, Damian Harris. He has moved up my rankings as we have gone throughout the week. He is now at okay. 24. So again, I talked about him with the over under challenge. It's like, what's the goal line work? Does he get the goal line work here? Or does it go to Ramondre Stevenson? We just don't have that guarantee. So I think he's going to be a fine option. Miami's run defense is actually pretty good, though. Yeah, they are. I have met 26. And obviously, as usual, I also have Jonu Smith as a start, but not nearly as strong a start as you do, which is fine. How about Jacoby Myers here? Nelson Aguilar is, is missing time, uh, practice time here. It might be just Jacoby Myers and bums. Are you starting him? Oh, man, I really don't want to start Jacoby Myers. I've got him at 41. Hey, garage door. Um, it's always. This is my second <laughs> podcast of the day, by the way. Garage door both times. Go ahead. Uh, with Jacoby Myers, he's going up against the Miami Dolphins secondary, like alone with... That has uh, Byron Jones, Xavier Howard, and Noah Igbenogany. Like, that is just an insane secondary to go up. It feels like the uh, the clip of, like, Michael Jordan looking at the Monstars in Space Jam. Like, it's Jacoby Myers, and and then he's going up, and no one else, and he's going up against a stacked team. So, I Jacoby Myers, fine option. He'll be a safe option, but I really, from a target perspective, but I'm not expecting crazy things from him. Yeah, I'm um, keeping him on the bench most likely this time. How about James White? Any interest there? No. 
I agree. Let's keep going to the Dolphins. Miles Gaskin. A lot of talk about Miles Gaskin this offseason. Are you firing him up in this one? Yes, as a low end running back, too. I think we're going to see the Patriots defense get back to uh, just dominating. Uh, so I'm not expecting a ton on the ground here from Gaskin, but as a receiver, I think you can get a minimum of six targets in this one. So that is the case. Then you got to start Miles Gaskin as a low end running back, too. I've got him at 23. I've got him at 24. You are way off. How about Mike Kosicki? Uh, again, he falls into this territory of an Austin Hooper and Dallas Goddard. It's like you can start him if you need to. I've got him at 14 on the week. Uh, but again, I'm not expecting crazy things from him. The one guy we recommended drafting everywhere, which everybody was excited about and got a lot of shares up, is really the only other guy who I think you're even talking about potentially starting. That is Jalen Waddell. Are you starting him in this game? Yes, sir. I've got Jalen Waddell at 35 on the week. Uh, you absolutely can start Jalen Waddell here as a wide receiver three option with tremendous upside. JC Jackson's going to be covering Devontae Parker in this one uh, with Stephon Gilmore out on the pup list and Jalen Waddle is going to be featured. He's going to be peppered with targets in this one. So I am super excited to see what Waddle does. I think this is going to be a coming out party for him. I think he's going to have a big game. I am super excited to see what he does as well. And he will, I will be watching him do it on my bench because I'm not starting him in this one at, he is 44th for me. So in a pinch, you could start him, but he is a sit, an official sit for me. I want to see it. It's just like I said, fair. you know, earlier with Devonta Smith, I want to see it with this, uh, but I am excited and I, I'm really going to be into this game. Everybody else for me is a sit. Saints against the Packers. You are obviously starting Alvin Kamara. How about Marquez Callaway, man? The standard deviation on his rankings in our expert consensus ranking is crazy. Are you starting Marquez Callaway? I think you definitely can, uh, but he's someone that I am like uh, with kind of the same, the, the way that you're viewing Jalen Waddle is the way that I'm kind of viewing Marquez Callaway, where it's like, I want to see it happen before I confidently plug him into my lineup. Uh, so with Callaway, he's at 44 in my wide receiver okay. rankings this week. So again, he's someone that you can start as a low end flex option that does come with upside, but I'm, I would love to see it happen first before I confidently plug him into my lineup. I've got him at 40, so that's the cutoff. So I will officially list him as a start. And I mean, Traquan Smith now is out with a hand, you know, missing practice with a hamstring. Yeah, Where I, else are they going with this ball? Like that that's right. that's part of They're going to need points in this game. I don't care about how Aaron Rodgers plays in Florida. They're going to need points in this game. The ball's got to go somewhere. Alvin Kamara is not going to get 45 touches here. So that's why I think I'm a little more bullish on him necessarily. But everybody else, and you're you're rostering Tony Jones Jr., obviously, but you're not yes. starting him in this game. Yeah, again, kind of same thing with Callaway. I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what Tony Jones Jr. can do with this role that he's got. And it's a fine matchup. The Green Bay Packers run defense is not great. So I think that Jones could have a good game, but a level of confidence, not there yet where I'm plugging him into my starting lineup. All right, how about on the other side? You know we're starting Aaron Rodgers. You know we're starting Aaron Jones. You know we're starting Devontae Adams. How about Robert Tunyon? You're good to go? Yep, he's a top 10 option for me uh, at tight end nine. Anybody else? A.J. Dillon, Marcus Valdez, Scantling, Randall Cobb, anybody wet your whistle at all? <laughs> Ew, I hate that phrase. Uh, That's a very old wet. Do you know it's not wet like I don't think W-E-T. It's like W-H-E. I'm sure, I but still, it, it doesn't make me like the phrase anymore. Uh, you should love it. It's a great <laughs> phrase. Go ahead. Uh, none of these guys. Again, this is one of these like that I'm, games that I'm going to be watching to see what the target share breaks down. Uh, but yeah, I'm not looking to start any of these guys. MVS has reportedly had a fantastic training camp yeah. and preseason, but we just don't we don't have any sort of confidence in him to see what we get from him to start him in week one. Giants against the Broncos. Are you starting Saquon in this game? I would prefer not to, but based on where you drafted him, you've got to start him. It's kind of the same yeah. thing with Ezekiel Elliott. It's like I didn't want to start Zeke last night, but you kind of had to because you spent yep. a top five pick on him. Depending on when you drafted with Saquon Barkley, you've got him. You spent a first round pick on him, if not a high second. So Saquon, I've got at 16 on the week. I'm not crazy excited to play him. I think that's right in line with ECR last time I checked. So you can start him, but... I just don't know what we're going to get here. He's still limited in practice. I don't know if he's taken contact in practice at all. So I just don't yeah. like that is super concerning for me. But you do projections and you go, well, Darius Slayton's dealing with an injury. Kadarius Tony right. probably going to play, but he's still dealing with an injury. Kenny Galladay probably not going to play. Evan Ingram not going to play. Kyle Rudolph still dealing with an injury. Like, where's the ball going to go? And if it's got to go to Saquon because he's the only freaking healthy body and that's Correct. in quotations. So I think Saquon, he's fine. I, I have him at RB13, and it's probably the worst I've ever felt about an RB13 <laughs> in my life. But I am starting him if I drafted him just because if he's going to play. And you never know, by the way, you get out there, right? Like, everybody's limited. He gets out there, the adrenaline gets going, and suddenly he just busts sure, off a huge sure. run. But obviously not a great matchup. But That's I'm a starting terrible him. matchup. 
terrible matchup. That is the only player I'm starting on the Giants. I mean, even if Kenny Galladay does suit up, I assume you are not rolling with him in this first No, one. nope. Not going anywhere yep. near him. Bench everybody else. For the Broncos, we're starting both wide receivers here with Sutton and Judy. Yeah, I've got both of them as uh, top 40 options. Uh, I've got Jerry Judy at 31, and I have mm -hmm. Cortland Sutton at wide receiver 40. So it technically makes the cutoff. Interesting. So you're a little lower, because uh, I have Su I have Judy at 33, so right where you do. But I have Sutton at 32, so you're a little worried about Sutton. I am. I mean, I, I think that he's fully healthy like i don't uh based on what we saw in the third yeah. preseason game i think he's fully healthy but it's just a matter of i think the ball is going to go to judy more than it is sutton uh and the cornerback matchup here is actually kind of it's it's a decent matchup for uh or i'm sorry it's a tougher matchup it's for, not good yeah no it's so not good for either, um, either one of them frankly i mean right so uh so and then with i talked about it with the potential game script narrative andrew erickson uh joked on wednesdays like do the giants even like score any points in this one and i was like <laughs> Probably not. Uh, this is not a good matchup. And so if that's the case, then they're just going to run the ball in the second half. I'm not expecting yeah. crazy things from Cortland Sutton here. All right. So they're going to run the ball in the second half. Which running back or both are you starting in this one? Yeah, both technically make the cutoff, but it's one of the situations where I'm like, I want to see it play out before I confidently rank them as top 24 options or whatever. So I've got Javante Williams at RB 27 on the week and then Melvin Gordon at RB 29. So they technically make the cutoff. You can start either of them if you need to. But based on where you drafted both of these guys, unless you have the injury to you know Gus Edwards or whatever, which we'll talk about in a little bit, yep. then Javante Williams, you might not have to start him. Uh, Melvin Gordon, you drafted as like an RB4, so you're probably not going to have to start him, but you can if you need to. Yeah, I mean, I've got them both a little bit lower. Javante Williams, technically a start because he slots in at RB30. Melvin Gordon, technically a sit because he's at 33, but you can get away probably with either one, and that's it for the Broncos. Oh, how about Noah Fant? I'm sorry, what about Noah Fant? Uh, ag here? Again, he's in that same cluster with Dallas Goddard and Austin Hooper and Mike Kosicki. I'm not, I'm not excited to start Noah Fant. I wasn't excited to draft him where he was going. Uh, again, the, I, he's not a touchdown scorer, so he's got to rely on volume, and I just don't see a path for volume in this offense, especially in this game. So I'm sitting Noah Fant if I can, but it's relative because I've still got him within my top 12 tight ends on the week. Right. I mean, I'm starting him. That's the bottom line. Like, I, you've got, we've got to make the cutoff somewhere. So he's my tight end nine. So I'm, I'm rolling him out there. I'm not expecting a huge game because once you get past the top, you know, six in tight ends, maybe seven. I'm never expecting a huge game from these guys, but I would start Noah Fant if I drafted him. Rams against the Bears. Yates, yates. Let's start with the Rams first. Give you a minute here to think about the Bears. Um, everybody, I guess. I'm Matthew Stafford, Daryl Henderson, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, Tyler Higby. Are you starting all of them? Yes, they all make the uh, the cutoff there. Matthew Stafford is going up against a Bears secondary. He's got the pass rush to worry about, of course, uh, but this secondary i mean you they let kyle fuller walk as a cap casualty which they shouldn't have they should have cut jimmy graham that's another conversation for another day uh and then you've got jalen johnson and kindle vildor mm -hmm. as your cb1 and cb2 here for the chicago yep. bears robert woods and cooper cup are both top 12 options for me easy this week they're gonna go just nuts uh so i think that you absolutely start matthew stafford in this one it's a primetime game i can't wait to see what he does here with sean mcveigh uh this is gonna be a ton of fun to watch it's going to be fun. Higby is, I'm lower on Higby, I think, than I, I usually will be this season. I don't I don't love it, uh, but he is still tight end 11 for me. So he is still somebody who I would start. You're not starting Sony Michelle in this one, assuming he's up, No, right? no. And I've got Daryl Henderson just inside my top 24 running backs. And then I've got Higby Correct. all the way up at six, man. So I think you, oh, you uh, do. Yeah, I've got Higby okay. definitely uh, as a must play option this week. The Bears allowed the fifth most uh, fantasy points to the tight end position last year off the top of my head. Yeah, five. Uh, averaging 9.8 fantasy points allowed per game. So you yeah. absolutely start Tyler Higby in this one. I think for me, it's just going to be so much of the wide receivers that I'm not sure how much That's volume fair. there's going to be for Higby. But again, he well, I'm starting him. I, he's in my top 12. So if I rostered him, I'm certainly not looking elsewhere. But I do expect, as you mentioned, monstrous games from Cup and Woods. I don't know if I could see monstrous games from all of them, you know, necessarily. Right. So that's kind of where I did my cutoff. Uh, for the Bears, yeah, it's, we, we talked about it on our stages yesterday. It's not a matchup that we really love, obviously, for Dave Montgomery or Allen Robinson, which we'll talk about in a second. But start with Montgomery. But he's still somebody who you drafted him to be your RB2. You're starting him as an RB2, right? Yeah, he's going to get too much volume in this one that you, you know, when you look at the other names behind him, excuse me, then I've got him at RB15. So it's like you look, oh my goodness, uh, you look at some of the other names around him and it's like, okay, well, I don't have as much confidence in Chris Carson, at Clyde edwards hilaire I don't know what his workload's going to be. It's a tough run defense in Cleveland. Mike Davis, Miles Sanders, DeAndre Swift. Like, I just don't know. With David Montgomery, I know he's going to get work. Yep. It's a tough matchup though. So I'm not expecting crazy, crazy things from him. He just vaults all the way up to RB15 in my rankings just because of the guys and the matchups that the other guys have. 
Yeah, he's 17 for me, but we're right in that range. We talked about Allen Robinson yesterday. I out Yates. Yates, I think you said 16 uh, 19. yesterday? 19. 19, okay. I'm 23. So this is obviously a bad matchup. But again, one of these things where the matchup, the very bad matchup, factors in, but not enough to move him outside of the starting range. Correct. Okay. Are you starting anybody else? You were a big Darnell Mooney guy, obviously, in the preseason. Yep. Some buzz about Cole Komet. Are you starting anybody else? Uh, Komet is a tight end 17 in my ranking. So okay. he's a guy yep. that falls into that same category where you can in a deeper league. Uh, and then Darnell Mooney is wide receiver 45 for me. So you can start him, but this is just an absolutely brutal matchup for opposing wide receivers. The Rams were the best in the NFL last year at shutting down fantasy wide receivers. So I will... Uh, I'll. I'll sit Mooney if I have him. And again, where you drafted him, you don't need to start him. Correct. It's sort of the Russell Gage type thing. These are guys right. who are great to have on your roster. You want to wait uh, to see how it goes. Let's go to our final game, Monday Night Football Raiders against the Ravens. There's a lot of, obviously, storylines with the Ravens. So let's start with the Raiders first so we can have some time. You are starting Darren Waller, of course. Are you starting Josh Jacobs in this one? Not if I can help it. Uh, I've got Josh Jacobs at 25 on the week. Uh, okay. So I am sitting him if I can. Uh, this is just an absolutely brutal matchup. I think that he's going to see work, uh, but the Ravens are going to go up big. They're going to go up big on the Raiders. Yep. And no matter who is playing running back, uh, again, which we'll get to, but no matter who is playing running back, they're going to go up big. And then it could be that you see Kenyon Drake come in and Josh Jacobs is just relegated to the bench because they're playing from behind. So I think that uh, da Josh Jacobs at 25, I'd rather play Damian Harris, Miles Gaskin, Daryl Henderson above him. Yeah, I would too. But to be clear, yeah, it's if you have somebody at twenty five, that's exactly where I have Jacobs. That's a start. Like I, again, I, I mean, yeah, right. no, like you start, you okay. can start him. I would prefer yes. to sit him if I can. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This is exactly where we are. Basically, a you get to that range, you don't really want to start him. But again, you look at the guys behind him in my rankings anyway. You know, Kareem Hunt and right. not guys I feel great about anyway. So I'm probably right. I'm starting Jacobs reluctantly, but he does make the cut. Anybody else on the Raiders that you want to start? Any of the wide receivers? There was a lot. Everybody's excited about Brian Edwards. You've obviously got Kenyon Drake, who could factor in as they play from behind. Anybody else? Uh, Marcus Peters uh, going down with a torn ACL. You know, obviously we hope for a speedy recovery for him. That that helps clear up the situation a little bit here. But this is still a, a very very tough matchup for opposing wide receivers. So I'm not looking to start Brian Edwards and Henry Ruggs in their first game. And again, based on where you dropped them, you don't have to. Okay, so for the Ravens, you're obviously starting Lamar Jackson, and you're obviously starting Mark Andrews. I didn't get to the news about the signing of Latavius Murray, which basically dropped last night, official this morning. But uh, they have signed Latavius Murray to the 53-man roster, by the way, not just to the practice right. squad like they did Le'Veon Bell. So I assume he's going to be suiting up here, but I can't imagine that he's going to take a big piece of this workload right off the bat. He doesn't know the playbook. He's just stepping in. So I am still pretty confidently ranking Tyson Williams. What about you? Uh, confident is a relative word. Uh, I've got him at 30 on the week. So he's okay. one of these That's guys. That's not it, confident. No. That is not confident. No. no. And I mean, it, the matchup screams that you start the running back here. And this running game in Baltimore, you could drop anyone in and they're going to be successful. So it's like, exactly. he, yeah, he can, be he can be successful here and he can be productive. But man, that is a huge leap of faith for a guy that was, the, was an undrafted free agent and was the RB3 on this depth chart, maybe even RB4, what, a month ago? So yeah. that is a massive leap of faith. Everything points to him being a value, but I just can't do it yet. It's one of those things that we talked about with Marquez Callaway and Tony Jones Jr. I want to see it happen. Uh, I don't think that Latavius Murray is going to factor in a ton here. Did Le'Veon Bell get signed to the 53-man roster, or is he still in the practice squad? Last I saw, he was still in the practice squad. The okay. expectation was he would be to the 53-man roster. But that was again, like what I thought, too. That was before Murray, right. before they signed Murray. And also, the, the word from uh, Harbaugh was just, we think that he might be ready to be <laughs> to go right. by Monday with Bell. And again, before Murray. So, I mean, you, you had mentioned it, by the way, Yates, when this injury to Edwards first happened, which was, uh, no, not when uh, the Edwards, when the Dobbins injury first happened, is they didn't really need the Latavius Murray type back right like that's not right. what was ideal for them now they kind of do now they right because yeah. they right now they do so this makes a lot more sense so i don't know what we're going to see but for me yates given the matchup given how good williams looked in this preseason he seemed to really earn their trust given how he's really the only one who kind of knows the playbook i have not rerun everything since the news worked that he was signed to the 53-man roster by the way right i thought it would be to the practice squad and then we'd mm -hmm. figure it out so i probably will right now he's rb williams rb 21 for me my guess is it's going to okay. fall a bit but I still can't imagine, man, that Latavius is going to factor in here heavily. 
or Le'Veon Bell, I'm firing him up as an RB2, I think, in this matchup, and I feel okay. About yeah, it. he's one of the guys that, you know, I say my ranking on him, and it's like, I, I feel like it's too low. Uh, and I yeah. can absolutely see as the, you know, the next couple of days, him rising up my rankings. Uh, you know, I, would I have more confidence in playing him over Josh Jacobs this week? I don't, I don't know, but the, the matchup suggests yes. So we'll see. We'll see what, uh, tune back in on Sunday morning, see what I find out. And and no wide receivers here. And if Le'Veon Bell no. goes, I assume you're not starting him, right? Nope, nope, nope. Very good. That's it, Yates. We did it. Ooh, that's a lot of that's a lot of ground to cover, my friend. Lot, We've got no no bye weeks or anything like that. But uh, you did an adequate job. I am uh, I am concerned about how much we agreed, but that's fine. Again, you can catch all more of us. I'll do an Instagram live, ten to eleven on our Fantasy Pros account on Sunday mornings. Yates will be doing a live start sit. YouTube stream they did all last year from 12 to 11, youtube.com slash fantasy pros. For this week, Joe Pizzapia is going to do the 11 to 12 uh, YouTube stream. Again, youtube.com slash fantasy pros. Starting next week, it will be Pat Fitzmorris until Tags recovers and reclaims his throne. Thank you to FanDuel. Remember, sign up with FanDuel. Get a 20% deposit bonus up to $500 and a free six-month subscription from fantasy pros by going to fanduel.com slash fp thanks also to christine auction for guiding my daughter in horror fantasy football draft every item imaginable everything guaranteed and affordable just go to pristine auction.com p-r-i-s-t-i-n-e auction.com have a wonderful weekend everybody enjoy your football we will talk to you again on sunday night thanks for tuning in to the fantasy pros youtube channel don't forget to check out our featured videos And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.